So with TB I'm doing the same thing as with HIV. There will be more information that I will be giving you than you see in your textbook. And it is because um, with the new MDR treatment guidelines it's quite complicated. So and MDR isn't in there. And do you see any MDR cases in the hospital? But they needed the transfer. Hmm? I did see one, but they needed the transfer to the same. To Brooklyn Chest? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of new drugs coming out now for TB that you will probably be using when you graduate. So I just want you to know of them that Rifafor isn't the only drug that is for TB. Okay. So TB is an ancient disease. Okay, they already discovered um, the earliest TB remains like 18,000 years before Christ. So uh, the mycobacterium is very old. They discovered it in mummies from Egypt. So it, um, it is a disease that has come and gone. And as long as we have HIV, it's probably going to stay with us. Okay. So, globally, one third of the world's population gets infected with TB. Most individuals will not get active TB. They will get latent TB. So, you know the difference between active and latent TB? Yes. Only 5 to 10 percent of people with normal immune systems develop active TB which means you get symptoms and then you can transmit it. Latent TB, you cannot transmit to other people because it's inside your body. Okay? So latently infected individuals have a 10% lifetime risk. However, HIV positive individuals have an extremely high chance of getting active TB. So this is an old epidemiology slide, but you can see the more greener the country gets, the higher the TB um, incidence rates. And if we look at TB, HIV co-infection, about 70% of our TB, people who has TB also has HIV. Or is it the other way around? Yeah, 70% of TB suspects is HIV positive. So these two go together. And um, the trick is then to give them or to wangle their ARVs and TB medication so that it doesn't interact with each other. So that the one compromises the other's effectiveness. And you probably know this, so you can just listen, you know, while you are also knowingly nodding. Okay, so mycobacterium tuberculosis is the bacteria that causes TB. So it is a special kind of bacteria. It's not our normal gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. It is a mycobacteria, which means the cell wall of TB looks different from the cell wall of your normal gram-positive and negative um, bacteria. It is also very um, resistant. It can lie dormant for a long time, you know, before it reactivates itself. Um, and then TB needs oxygen to be able to survive. So it's an aerobic bacteria. That's why it likes to infect the lungs because there's usually a lot of oxygen in the lungs. So if we look at the TB uh, cell wall, 
Um, you can see there is the cell membrane on the inside and then we have a peptide of lichen layer. So that's a little bit the same as your gram positive and negative bacteria because they also have peptidoglycan layers. However, TB has got two extra layers. The arabinogalactan layer and the mycolic acid layer. Okay, so in addition to the peptidoglycan layer that most bacteria have, this one has got two extra layers that is protecting it. So cell division, TP in comparison to other bacteria, divides relatively slowly, okay, within 16 to 24 hours, it will double. I probably don't have to tell you about how TP is transmitted. Um, this might be interesting, less than 10 bacteria can cause an infection, so you actually need a very low amount. Um, there's a high rate of mutation that can cause drug resistance, and TB can survive outside the body for 2-3 to three days in a wet, dark, damp environment. Okay? It can only survive about 5 minutes in fresh air and sunlight. So that's why you want things to be clean, okay, with sun coming in preferably. So the transmission, aerosol droplets, a single sneeze can release about 40,000 droplets at a time. Um, and each droplet can contain up to 3,000 TB bacilli. So when a person with untreated TB sneezes, it's like happy times. Because how many bacteria can cause an infection? Ten. So if you are inhaling one droplet of 3,000 bacteria, you know, That makes sneezing and coughing and high, you know, hygiene a little bit important. So, you know, ventilation, crowded living, humidity, remember it likes damp areas, ultraviolet radiation kills it. Um, those are some of the environmental factors. So the chances of getting TB or your risk of getting TB depends on two things. The source, so this is the infected person, how well do they cough, are they coughing, you know, high frequency, is it like a projectile vomit type of thing or is it falling here, yeah. so cough strength is important. If they've got a positive sputum smear, and that implies that it is possible to have TB with a negative sputum smear, hey. Um, if they are on effective treatment, so the faster they get on treatment, the less TB will be transmitted, and if they've got a lung cavitation. So in the host, um, your risk depends on your age, so young children and very old people are very susceptible. If you have compromised immunity or if your immunity is fine, you are less likely to get it. People with diabetes and HIV are more at risk. People with silicosis, which will be your... Which type of occupation might show up with silicosis. Mine. Mm -hmm. mine. Yes, mine. So that on the TB form, um, you ask them, are you a mine worker? Because those occupation 
um, is more likely to get TB because they might also get or have silicosis. Did you um, hear on the news that the um, people won the case against some or other mining company who's going to pay out everybody that got silicosis? I don't know how that's going to work, but yeah, that is something good, you know. Um, companies taking responsibility for their occupational hazards. Um, medication, if the host is on any immunosuppression medication, the risks are higher socioeconomic status, which means you stay in a small house and maybe are in contact with other TB people. Access to healthcare and malnutrition increases your risk. Okay, so the pathogenesis, I hope this isn't boring you. So you, must I explain this or do you know this very well? You inhale TB into your lungs. In the lungs the TB gets eaten by macrophages, okay? Now, the way the macrophages kills is it eats the TB and then it can, it can um, take some enzymes from another brachial, become acidic, and the TB might die or it might not die. So TB can survive inside the macrophages. Now if the TB is inside the macrophages, the macrophages are immune cells, so they are um, releasing the cytokines, okay? So the cytokines are telling other immune cells to come to this place because there's an infection, okay? And so there are more and more immune cells coming together in this place in the lung, okay? And they start to form a, a tubercle, and in a few we weeks, the middle macrophages might start dying, okay? Where the TB can now, you know, run around there inside the tubicle, okay? So some of them are still inside the macrophages in those acidic vacuoles, and others are swimming around in that caseous type of environment inside the tubicle. It's low oxygen, so they are not thriving. So the immune system is keeping them in one place. Okay. So that is where latent TB comes from. So if you have a good immune response, then this tubicle is going to stay like it is and it's going to start to be calcified and then you're going to have a little thingy in your lung. But nothing is going to happen. You're not going to get sick. When this thing opens, or when the immune system is, is not able to keep the TB inside the tubicle, it bursts, okay? And that is when you are starting to now show symptoms of TB, and you will be able to start coughing it out now. And spreading it. Um, a tubicle never really heals. Okay, so even when you have been healed from TB, there will still be a piece of your lung that is not available for functioning anymore. Okay, that's why um, if you will find that many people who has had TB, you know, because some people get TB like three or four times during their lifetime, and then there might be like a COPD type of illness due to this TB that has, you know, compromised a large part of the lung. Is this the same or different from what we learned? So, okay. So, diagnosis. 
You probably know how to screen for TB in your sleep. Um, sputum examinations. So we diagnose TB with an expert. We monitor treatment with smear microscopy. And um, if there is a smear negative TB, we will usually wait for a culture. So a gene expert can pick up TB and pampasin resistance. So it is a two in one. It is very sensitive and it needs about 130 TB bacteria per mole of sputum to give a positive test. For a smear microscopy, you basically take the sputum, you fix it on a slide, you stain the TB, you look through the microscope, you count the number of bacteria. Usually with the smear microscopy, we're looking at a sensitivity of about 100 to 300. Um, bacteria. So you can see the gene expert is actually much more sensitive. So you might get a smear positive TB or a smear negative TB. Smear positive TB, there's a higher risk of transmission. Smear negative TB um, usually happens in people with uh, compromised immunity or with children because they can't give you know, let them speed them that nicely. Um, so then, in a case of a smear negative TB, you have to wait for the culture. Because the culture is very, it's the most sensitive out of all of them. Um, so the smear is still used. So the expert is used to diagnose. The smear is still used to monitor treatment. In the case of your first line or people on first line regimens, you usually do your smear after seven weeks so that you can um, decide when you are going from your intensive phase to your continuation phase. If your smear is still positive, you will continue your intensive phase usually until the smear is negative. In MDRTB, they do smears every month of treatment. Okay, so the culture is the most sensitive test. You might get nothing on the expert, you might get nothing on the um, smear, but you might get something on the culture. So culture can pick up between 10 and 100 bacteria in a sample. Um, culture and sensitivity will also tell you which antibodies the, um, the TB is sensitive to. Okay. So the goals of TB treatment, the first goal is to cure the patient, the second goal transmission, decrease transmission, prevent the development of resistance, prevent relapse, and prevent death and TB complications. Principles is usually combination treatment. There's an intensive and a continuation phase. The time period varies depending on which, what type of TB you are treating, and adherence is very important. So this principle is almost the same as HIV. What is the main difference between the principles of HIV treatment? and TB treatment that you can see here. Do you use combination therapy in HIV? Yes. yes. Do you need to be adherent? Yes. Yes. So what is the different one? The time. Because for ARVs, how long? Life. Life long, yes. And for TB, you actually stop taking it after a while. So that's good. Okay, so if we look at first line regimen, um, usually they give rifafor, so it is a combination of that four um, medications. So rifampicin works on RNA synthesis. Pyrazinamide compromises the cell membrane. 
Ethambutyl stops the synthesis of the arabinogalactan layer and isoniazole stops the synthesis of the mycolic acid layer. So you can see again, like with HIV, they work at different points of the organism's replication process. So um, we have to combine them like that to minimize the chance of resistance. Because remember, we are treating for a long period of time, so you want to hit the microorganism at as many different targets as possible to keep him off balance to prevent resistance. So rifampicin inhibits mycobacterial RNA synthesis. Isoniazid inhibits the synthesis of the mycolic acid layer. Um, Ethambutyl inhibits the synthesis of the abirogalactin <coughs> layer. And pyrazinamide is a very interesting drug. Okay? Because it only works on dormant TB bacteria. If the bacteria is actively metabolizing, okay, the um, uh, pyrazinamide will be pumped out of the cell. Okay. So pyrazinamide will go into a dormant TB bacteria inside the cytoplasm of the cell it will um, become an acid so it will split in two and the more pyrazinamide that can accumulate inside the cell the more acidic the environment becomes so eventually it starts compromising the cell membrane of the TB but this is only true in dormant TB. So TB that is actively replicating and metabolizing will pump out the pyrazinamide. Okay, so it's an interesting drug. <laughs> so TB treatment, your first line regimens, you get a normal pulmonary TB, uh, which is your simple TB. You will have your intensive phase with the four drugs for two months. Do a sputum at seven weeks. If the sputum is smear negative, you change to continuation phase. If the sputum is still smear positive, you will continue intensive phase for another month. And do a follow-up sputum. So the intensive phase is for two months. The continuation phase is for four months. So that's for simple TB. Then you get severe or complicated TB. So that will be your TB meningitis, your TB bone um, or joints, or miliary TB. You know what miliary TB is? So miliary TB is TB that has got a lot of little tubercles all over the lungs, not one big one. So miliary TB is, means it's like disseminated in the lungs. So there's more than one tubercle that we are treating. So the, the main difference between a severe or complicated TB will be your continuation phase where you will need seven months of treatment in your severe cases and four months of treatment in your simple TB cases. Okay. So for children less than eight years or less than 30 kilograms, we usually omit the ethambutol um, because you obviously know why we are omitting it. What is the side effect of ethambutol that we are concerned about in kids? Optic neuritis, yes. So you can't really do a vision test in kids because, you know, they'll have to tell you what can you see. Um, 
So that's why we don't use ethan butyl for kids for your simple TB regimens, but for your complicated TB you will add ethan butyl. And the duration is the same. So monitoring and efficacy. Um, efficacy testing, we will do a follow-up sputum smear microscopy. Um, we'll monitor the weight, what must happen to the weight of a TB patient when they're on treatment. It must increase, yes. So if the weight are increasing, we know that it is working. Um, for ethambutal, we do vision testing. Okay, so uh, how would you explain if it is a, a woman family planning and contraception? I said use tablets, use tablets, use injections. Okay. Induction. Mm -hmm. Yes. So which which um, one is the enzyme inducer, the potent enzyme inducer? The rifampicin. The yes. Rifampicin, potent enzyme inducer, decrease or increases the metabolism of estrogen. Your estrogen levels fall to sub therapeutic range, and your family or your contraception is compromised. Adherence is important. You have to monitor for side effects. Um, and obviously you're going to do an HIV test when you are diagnosing a TB. So specifically side effects, rifampicin, usually many of these TB drugs has got your GI problems. So you want to take them off the food. Rifampicin, especially it causes red or brown and discoloration of body fluid. Um, Isoniazid, main problem there is your peripheral neuropathy, so you can supplement with pyridoxine. Um, if I'm butyl, ocular neuritis, and pyrazinamide, although it's also hepatotoxic, um, it might precipitate gout. So people might complain of, you know, joint pains. So you've got three lovely um, hepatotoxic drugs that we are using together, which is rifampicin, isoniazid, and pyrazinamide. If I'm butyl, it's the only one that is liver friendly. Okay. transmission, it can cure the TB with minimal problems or it can cure the TB with some lung function impairment um, and we are preventing transmission in the OR and death. So, the treatment of drug resistant TB at the moment is in flux. So, um, there has been an interim guideline for 2018 that was released by the Department of Health. However, they are just waiting for the WHO to update their guidelines at the end of the year and then we will get our official new MDR, XDR treatment guidelines in 2019. So it will probably look a lot the same with some minor, minor details. So drug resistant TB, you can get mono resistant TB, which means it is only resistant to one. Yes. So with gene expert, we automatically will know if there is any rifampicin resistance. MDR TB is resistance to rifampicin and isoniazid. 
So that's why you will see if a butyl and pyrazinamide still being used in the MDR treatment regimens. XDR treatment they are um, resistant to four. Profamsin, isoniazid, any fluoroquinolone or any injectable. So if you have three of the four, they call it pre-XDR. Okay, so you can either be resistant to rifampicin, isoniazid and a fluoroquinolone and then either to rifampicin, isoniazid or injectable. However, we are totally phasing out injectables at the moment in the new guidelines. So actually, the main problem is then if you are resistant to fluoroquinolone. Okay, and that's one of the reasons why we want to remove fluoroquinolones from first-line treatment. Remember the fluoroquinolones are a DNA synthesis inhibitor <coughs> antibiotic. So fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin has always been used as first-line treatment for an uncomplicated UTI. So at the moment, they want to move away from ciprofloxacin so because it has got a lot of side effects, but also they want to minimize any type of underlying resistance in bacteria so that it can be kept for um, drug resistant TB. So isoniazid resistance is an interesting one. <coughs> there are two resistant mutations that they specifically look at. You don't have to know this, but it will help you understand the regimens. So you can either get a partial iron isoniazid resistance where high dose isoniazid is still effective. Even though you might have an MDR TB high dose might still be effective. So it's only a partial resistance. So there are these two mutations in the TB bacteria that they test for. If there's only one of them, if only the INHA mutation is available, we can still use high dose isoniazid in our MDR treatment regimen. If it's the cat G mutation, we use ethionamide. So, ethionamide and um, isoniazid is like cousins. So, they have got cross resistance with each other. Okay. Um, if there is resistance to both of these, then we cannot use isoniazid or ethionamide anymore. Okay. So, you don't have to learn that for the test, but it will help you understand the regimens. So, our old MDR treatment regimen that still had our injectables. I'm going to go through that regimen because some patients may still be on that regimen anyway. Um, you will usually have your injectable, which will be an aminoglycoside. What is the main toxicity that we are concerned about with aminoglycosides? Nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity. So many people went deaf. And, deaf. and that is why um, they decided to try and get injectables totally out because of the high incidence of nephrotoxicity and many people couldn't like tolerate it. Then we have a fluoroquinolone which used to be moxifloxacin, ethionamide, teresidone, parazinamide and ethambutol. Okay, so people might be on ethambutol or they might not be on ethambutol. Um, so is that 5 plus 1 treatment? Um, and this w was only for patients who haven't been exposed to the second line treatments yet. Otherwise, you would look at the drugs that they were on and try to use other drugs. 
So you would have had six months of intensive phase treatment and then 18 months of continuation phase treatment without the injectable. The moxifloxacin could be um, substituted by levofloxacin, especially in children and people who cannot tolerate moxifloxacin. Okay? But um, you will find that many people who have MDR for a second time or who are failing on the current regimen, um, the history of the, the TB treatment that they have been on needs to be taken. So you don't want to use the same treatment as they have used before. They will have a look at the drug sensitivity testing results and um, look at cross resistance and then if they can tolerate so if we look at the old MDR treatment drugs or drug groups, um, usually you would have your two first line agents there, which is ethambutal and pyrazinamide. So it's a little bit more tricky to um, test for resistance of pyrazinamide because you need a dormant bacteria. Bacteria that we grow in the lab is actually growing, so it's very tricky to test for pyrazinamide resistance. Um, anyway, your second group would have been your injectables, then you have your fluoroquinolones, oral antibacteriostatic drugs, which would have been your ipionamide and teresidone, and then drugs of unclear efficacy. And you can see there's a lot of um, there's a lot of other like your normal antibiotics there as well because this is where people don't know what to do anymore. So they're trying to use stuff that isn't really so great. You can see there the cross resistance. There is cross resistance between ethionamide and isoniazid. Probably you will have then resistance with clarithromycin and um, cyclosurine and teresidone if it's resistant to the one, it's resistant to the other one. Paraminosalicylic acid or PAS is a nice one because it prevents resistance of the other drugs from forming. Yeah, so that is our old lot, and now with the new guidelines, we are taking injectable drugs out of the equation. Okay, so if we look at, we can look at the mechanisms now. I'll first tell you what is the drugs. So this is from studies. This um, guidelines are based from studies or clinical trials that is hot off the press, okay? Um, where you are base, we are basically um, replacing our aminoglycosides with pedaquilin and linozolid. What do you know about linozolid? What can you remember about linozolid? You've heard about it before. Mm -hmm. And? No. Linozolid is our last line antibiotic for gram positive resistant gram positive infection. So, when we were looking at how linozolid is classified by the WHO, it's one of those ones that we want to reserve. Okay. So, I don't know how this is going to work out, but at the moment, the new short regimen for MDRTB is two months of linozolid. So, you only take the linozolid for two months because apparently the linozolid protects 
the bedaquilin. So it protects resistance against bedaquilin. So bedaquilin is the new TB drug or one of the new TB drugs um, that has been produced in the last, I don't know how many years, when there has been no TB drugs. Then you have high dose isomycin. You still have your fluoroquinolone, which we prefer in the new one to be levofloxacin. The reason why we prefer levofloxacin is because of the side effect of QT prolongation. If you look, if you compare moxifloxacin with levofloxacin, moxifloxacin's propensity to cause QT prolongation is much higher than levofloxacin's. And you have the daquilin that can cause QT prolongation as well as clofazamine. So there are three drugs in this regimen that can cause QT prolongation. So what do you think is one of the monitoring things that we are going to do for patients? How do we monitor QT? Institute. Yes. So you have to do very frequent ECGs on patients. Okay. And then you have your pyrazinamide and ethambutol. At the moment, if you look at our resistance data, there's not too much resistance to ethambutol and pyrazinamide, and that is why they are still there. Okay, so they might go away if we find that there are too much resistance. So that is your intensive phase, which can last four to six months. So with MDR TB, you're going to do a, a, um, a sputum sample every month. Every month they have to have a smear. Okay. And once the smear becomes negative, they can go on to their continuation phase. And essentially with the continuation phase, you take away... The, um, so the linozolid will be stopped first because it's only for two months. Then your high dose isoniazid will also be stopped in four months time and your bedaquilin will go on until six months. And after the six months you will only be on those drugs for five months. So it's less than a year of treatment versus how long did we treat MDR previously? About two years. Yeah. Yes. So that is why it's called the short regimen. It's the new short regimen. Okay. I want to ask you a question about this regimen. So they are using high dose isoniazid in this regimen. What can we assume about the resistance profile of this MDR TB? Partial resistant to isoniazid. Yes. So there's partial resistance to isoniazid in this regimen. So remember they test for two resistance mutations. So this will only have the INHA mutation and not that one because we are using high dose isoniazid. So you will find with these TB regimens, with these TB regimens, it is very dependent on your resistance test. Obviously, your gene expert will cover for your uh, rifampicin resistance, but there are a first line line that they call a line probe assay that they are going to do in the labs, and then they are going to look for the amount of or these two mutations, and if it's only one of the mutations, they will be using your high dose isoniazid. Yes. They substitute 
the bedaquiline with another new TB drug called the laminate. Okay, so everything stays the same except the bedaquiline is substituted with the laminate. Children 6 to 12, and in children under 6 years of age, they substitute the delaminate with ferroaminosalicylic acid, the PAS. Okay. And that might probably change in the new guidelines or when they get new evidence. Because uh, bedaquiline and delaminate, it might be their toxicity, but uh, usually in clinical trials they will not test on children. So they will only start to see how the drug reacts in children once it's been used more widely. Okay. So that's the new short regimen. So there's also a long regimen for MDR-TB. Okay. So this is probably, you don't see the isoniazid in there. So it's the one that it probably has the two mutations. So when they find the two mutations, then it's the long regimen that you are on. It's still shorter than the old regimen, but it's now the, the long regimen. So for adults, so you will see there's no, um, there's no, what do you call it? What is missing here from the other one? The ethambutol is not here and what other one is also not here? The pyrazinamide. So it doesn't have pyrazinamide. Instead it has the residone. Okay? And it doesn't have the high dose isoniazid. Okay. So that's also your intensive phase, six to eight months, and your continuation phase then will only be three drugs will, that will be for 12 months. Okay. So in children, it becomes more complicated. So for, for, the new, for the long regimen in children, you will use either one of these and it will depend on what the doctor decides. It will depend on the experience of the doctor and the resistance profiles and everything like that. So it will be linozolid or pedaculin delaminate or paras PAS. Then you will have your levofloxacin, clofazamine and teresidone with high dose isoniazid or ethionamide. So it will depend on which mutation there is. Okay. If you have the INHA mutation, you give isoniazid. If you have the CAT mutation, use the ethambutol. Um, intensive and continuation phase is the same, so you basically drop the linozolid, the first two drugs, except if they started with PAS, then you keep on with PAS for the whole region. And this will depend on the... So pre-XDR and XDR is basically defined by the fact that the patient also have resistance to a fluoroquinolone. So we cannot use levofloxacin in a pre-XDR or XDR patient. Because we're not using injectables anymore, that resistance becomes less important. So for here you will see there are no levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. And it's because there will be resistance to it. 
so you can't use it anymore. So you will have your linozole, the daquilin. You will add the laminate or paraminobacillic acid. So you'll use the two together. The phasamine, the residue, pyrazinamide, and either high dose acinizer or ethionamide, or if there are mutations for both, then you can't use one of them. You won't use this one. So that is for six to eight months and continuation phase. You will drop the bedaquilin and the delaminate, but you will go on with the linozole. And the clofazamine and the risdone. So it's lots of medications. So I don't necessarily need you to remember the regimens. I just want you to remember some things about the new drugs. For example, the daquilin. The daquilins. Oh, let's quickly go back to the mechanism of action now. So if we look at the mechanism of action of these ones, so isoniazid and ethionamide will work on the mycolic acid biosynthesis. The laminate causes a reactive species. So if they, if they are forming like a radical, a free radical, the free radical will usually cause harm to the... To the um, things in the bacteria, like it might damage its DNA or it might damage its protein or RNA. Okay, your um, fluoroquinolose will, it will inhibit DNA synthesis, rifampicin RNA synthesis, linozolid, um, your injectables and fluorothromycin will inhibit protein synthesis. Um, Paramino salicylic acid, PAS, will inhibit folic acid synthesis, like which other antibiotic also inhibits folic acid synthesis? Can you remember which antibiotics they are? Sulfonamides, yes. Sulfonamides and trimethoprim. Okay, clofazamine causes membrane destabilization and reactive species, almost the same as the laminate. Then clarizidone will inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis, um, and the daquilin uh, inhibit ATP synthase. So the bacteria can't make its own. Um, ATP is energy, so it can't make energy anymore. So, all of those drugs that we are combining is working at different places. Okay. Which makes sense because you want to target the bacteria at as many different targets as possible so that it can't be better resistance. Okay. So, the problem with our new regimes, our short regimes, is not anymore because now we're dropping the injectable. So we don't have the nephrotoxicity and the ototoxicity anymore. However, we are gaining cardiotoxicity. Okay, because almost all of the new drugs prolong QT intervals. Okay, so we are not necessarily going to monitor creatinine clearance or creatinine anymore. We are going to monitor ECG now. Okay, so QT prolongation, you need to stop pedaculin if it becomes more than 50, 500 milliseconds or something like that. Um, there's drug interactions with your fluoroquinolones, macrolides, clofazamine and the laminate. I didn't put the laminate there, but the laminate also causes QT prolongation. Um, the other thing about bedaquilin is that it is metabolized via the hepatic microenzymes. Okay, so any enzyme inhibitors or inducers are going to increase or decrease bedaquilin levels. 
So it doesn't like being used with other enzyme inducers. And pedaculin is actually quite a toxic drug. Um, so in the, um, in the studies, that, uh, the clinical trials, there was an increased risk of mortality for using pedaculin. But obviously, when you are deciding to use a drug, there's always the risk versus benefit type of decision that needs to be made. So obviously they decided that the increased risk of mortality isn't overshadowing the risk of NDRT or the consequences of NDRT. So Dorizidone has been used before in the NDR treatment. Um, Similar to isoniazid, it can cause peripheral neuropathy. You can either treat with pyridoxine or amitriptyline. Um, Teresidone also have psychiatric side effects. Um, so it can cause seizures and anxiety, depression or psychosis. That needs to be watched. Clofazamine. Uh, accumulate in tissues, okay? Uh, it also causes that red-brown pigmentation, which drug in the first regimen also causes that? Discoloration of urine, tears, saliva, sweat. First regimen, which one causes it? Hmm? Rifampicin, yes. Okay, so in the second regimen, in most of the second regimens, you're going to use clofazamine, so same side effect that's happening. Can't get away of this discolored body fluids. Um, other thing about uh, clofazamine, it's got some GI side effects, and you need to monitor hepatic and renal function. And it also causes QT prolongation. So in your normal regimens, it will be bedaquilin, clofazamine, and your liver floxacin that can cause QT prolongation. The laminate, very new. I had to go on the internet to find information on it because it's not in the same yet. Um, it's the newest TB drugs, also causes quite severe QT prolongation. Um, most common side effects, nausea, vomiting, and dizziness. Okay. I'm not going to go through TB prevention. Do you know about isoniazid preventative therapy? Did you learn about it? So usually if someone is HIV positive and they do not have TB symptoms, if they've got a negative TB screen, there is the possibility of putting them on isoniazid preventative treatment in order to prevent this person from getting TB. Now, usually people who has a positive skin test um, has better results than people who don't or better in the clinical trials they saw it. Um, so, have you seen skin tests before? Man do. Not. Okay. So, in very low virgin countries, they use man to to diagnose TB, but we use the symptom screen because many people who's got latent TB can also have a positive man to. And because we've got so many people who is infected with TB but not actually sick, 
Mantis might give false positives because it's seeing TV but it's not active. So basically it is a protein, a, a TB protein that you inject underneath the skin. Okay? And the person then has to come back in 72 hours. So if the person already have TB antibodies, which you probably would have if you've been latently infected, if then there would be a response they like a, t a blister type of thing will fall. And the bigger the blister, the, um, the more it, it, it the, like, the bigger it makes, the, so at a certain point of size, it means that you are positive, you have a man to positive test. Now in people who are, um, if you have an induration of 10 or more millimeters, it's considered a positive test, okay? Uh, in 15 or more millimeters, it's considered positive <coughs> people with known factors, with no known risk factors for TB. So if you have a HIV positive person or a person whose immune system is compromised, your man too will become positive at a smaller diameter than a person who's got an active immune system. Which makes sense because the, this thingy is caused by an immune response against the, the TB proteins. Okay, so HIV positive people need a smaller diameter than people with a normal immune system to have a positive test. But it can be false positives in the case of light and So they usually use managers in children. But the problem is that they have to come back after three days and for it to be read, so many people don't come back, so it's a little bit, they don't really use it if they don't have So you know about infection control. So there's a point about leprosy in your handbook. I'm not really worried too much about it. Leprosy is also a type of mycobacteria infection that affects the skin peripheral nerves and mucosa of the upper respiratory tract and it, depending on its severity it might be treated with rifampicin and dapsone. If it's a very severe one you can use rifampicin, dapsone and rifampicin for either 6 or 12 months. Okay. The last little part that we still have to cover is our normal antivirals. So we did antiretrovirals, but we didn't do like normal antivirals. So obviously, um, antiretrovirals is for your retroviruses, which is HIV. Um, for normal viral infections, we talk about herpes, influenza, cytomegalovirus, and hepatitis B and C. So that is your common viral infections. So if you can remember, the difference between bacteria and viruses, bacteria can replicate by itself. A virus needs to infect a host cell because it cannot replicate by itself. So a retrovirus carries RNA, a normal virus carries DNA. Okay, so that's why the retrovirus needs to bring its own reverse transcriptase. Okay, but the, the normal virus can, the, the DNA, it's already in DNA form. So it can just be normally incorporated. So it just needs that enzyme that incorporates it 
into the host DNA. So you will usually find an attachment. So hepatitis is usually drawn to liver cells and it's usually the receptors on top of the cells that it will bind to. Attach, become endocytosed, it loses its capsule, the DNA goes into the host cells, the host cells start to make all the different types of protein needed to build the new virus, and then the virus assembles and a new virus comes out, or many new viruses comes out. Okay. So the problem with antiviral therapy is limited efficacy. So we cannot really cure viral, well we can cure hepatitis C now, but most viral infections is not curable. Like HIV you have to treat for a long time because antivirals are virus static. Okay. So with hepatitis B, you can't really cure it. You can control it, um, but it's not curable. So um, we don't get too excited about antiviral treatments. Um, and we treat mainly symptomatically for virus B. So if the virus causes a fever, you treat the fever. You won't necessarily give an antiviral. So our first set of antivirals that we are looking at is cyclover, gancyclover, valacyclover, valgancyclover, okay? They inhibit viral DNA polymerase. Okay. So they are DNA synthesis inhibitors. Okay. So they are a lot like our nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors because they also get incorporated in a part of the DNA and then it stops the DNA from replicating further once it is incorporated. So the cyclovir is preferred in the treatment of your herpes viruses like varicella zoster which causes shingles, heard about shingles, yeah, and herpes simplex, okay. So main problem with the side liver, especially if you have to give it IV, it's quite nephrotoxic. Okay, the side liver, it's preferred for cytomegalovirus, um, which usually infects your um, immunocompromised patients. So this might include HIV patients or patients who have transplants. Okay, that is on immunosuppressive therapy um, and many times it, the psychomegalovirus affects the eye. So the nice thing about Gansiclover is that it penetrates the intraocular fluid quite well. So um, it's quite effective for the cytomegalovirus eye infections. Unfortunately it's contraindicated in pregnancy. And the main problem with gansiclover is that it causes myelosuppression. Probably the reason why it is contraindicated in pregnancy as well. Okay. So then we get another class of antivirals, which is called our neuraminidase inhibitors. Okay. Examples is enamivir and oseltamivir. Um, they are mainly works where they inhibit the release of the influenza virus from the cell. So if we look at the replication cycle, 
like the DNA, like a site lever will work here because it inhibits DNA synthesis. The neuraminidase inhibitor works here when it is going out already. Okay. HIV also had sticks which binds to the CD4 receptor. So you will usually get your H whatever in strains of flu. So your H1N1 is usually your swine flu and your H5N1 is usually your bird flu. And that's how they name the pandemics. Hopefully we don't have an outbreak. Or do we? Okay. So basically, your neuraminidase is one of the little thingies that sticks out of the viral envelope. Okay. So your hemagglutinin will then link and get the virus in. But when the virus goes out, it will still be linked there, so it will be docked like a ship, you know, when you throw out the anchor. So what the neuraminidase then do is it cuts that thing. When the virus is out, it cuts this so that the virus can then be removed from the cell. So if you are inhibiting this action, the virus is just going to stand out from the cell and not go anywhere. So they did a clinical trial on the effectiverness on oseltamivir um, and you have to unfortunately initiate treatment within 24 to 48 hours of the onset of symptoms. It has a modest effect on the decreasing of duration of your cold and flu. Okay. Um, prophylaxis is not recommended only in high risk patients. So if you are a nurse working in an outbreak of swine flu, then you will take that. But it's not recommended for routine prophylaxis. Okay. The main side effects is nausea and vomiting. And there has been a few reports of fatal neuropsychiatric adverse effects. Um, and then Zanamivir is um, the other drug in the class, which is formulated as an inhalation. So interesting, these two are also used in prophylaxis to, or treatment of the Ebola virus. Um, with, you know, I don't know what the success rate is there. Really? So are they going to take it to the Congo? I hope they do. Okay. Um, then important, the only real way to prevent viral infections is to vaccinate. Okay. So all high-risk populations need to be vaccinated against influenza every year. For example, healthcare workers, pregnant women, HIV positive people. And the best time to vaccinate is from April onwards during the winter month. Okay. And that is that. Are there any questions? So I will send out the venues for the test. The test venues have changed because we couldn't get the same test venues in the second semester. So it will be more spread out over campus. 
on the 31st. So um, I will still send. So make sure you know in which, which venue you are writing. Okay. So I'll still send out a list with the surnames and the people in which venue they are. Okay. Are there any questions?